it, it's a piece of work we did, which is, uh, which is the kind of stuff that gets done around these parts, which is um, taking trade populations and running analytics on those with market data to try and figure out risk in P&L on your trade population. Uh, the, the work we've done uh, essentially is going to be about you know, the portability aspect of Beam. This has been done in anger on Google Dataflow as well as uh, Flink. And, and then we'll talk about um, the particular aspects of calling C++ processes from within, within Beam and, and the consequences of doing that. Um, the, the, um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but anyone who's, who's from these parts uh, knows the rationale for why we do these things. And the, the environment is getting even more challenging and uh, even more regulatory driven, and, and the costs are going up. So, so there's a real challenge about trying to scale risk engine processes out. They tend to be uh, batch-based processes mainly. Today, um, you know, they, they run for eight or nine hours overnight. Uh, they run on tens of thousands of cores. And that is, is getting worse uh, as time goes by, as the, as the regulatory uh, requirements increase. So that's the, that's the reason why we looked at this. This is just the anatomy of a, a typical risk engine. Uh, <coughs> trades and market data come in from the left-hand side. You have a workflow process which controls that progression of, uh, of the calculation. There sometimes is a cache which holds state. Uh, the, the, the data is distributed across a grid. You can either use, I mean, typically people use things like Symfony from IBM or, or Data Synapse from TEPCO, and, and the results are put into a large data repository for downstream processing. I mean, that's, that's the typical batch usage that happens in financial services. Um, and the rest of the story that Fred will, will take from here on is how we translated this into Apache Beam and that ecosystem. Yeah, so <clears throat> enter our hero, Apache Beam. Um, so everybody should be familiar with the uh, Beam model. Uh, really, we're just uh, have an abstraction uh, in the Beam layer that runs uh, in, a, it's written in the particular SDK, and it runs on a variety of runners. So at the core of the Beam API, you've got your do fun, um, you apply a function against an immutable P collection, uh, and you have uh, many or, or no output P collections. So the first challenge uh, with financial services is most of your analytics libraries are written in C++. Um, and so if you think about how it's actually running in the worker process, um, the Java container is got your do fun. Uh, you've got to communicate uh, to the C++ via JNI. So next slide, please. Um, so typically what happens is somebody writes some bad code. You've got some access violations, seg faults, memory leaks, or allocation errors, et cetera. Um, now the difference between Java and C++ obviously is with C++, um, next slide, your uh, process will die and it crashes. Um, so that's not very good for when your worker is trying to do work. Um, so next slide, please. So a note about uh, data flow exception handling. Uh, so we were using Cloud Dataflow to start with. Um, so in our case, we have a batch uh, retry of, it, sorry, it'll happen where you have four retries uh, in batch mode. Um, after that, uh, the pipeline will stop processing. Uh, so if you imagine you have a report you're trying to run, you have a thousand trades and you're trying to price uh, one particular trade crashes, now all of a sudden your report will not get generated and you're stuck in the water. Same with, um, pardon me, streaming, uh, it's retry indefinitely, which probably is even worse. So um, one of the ways to deal with this is the outer process call. Now what you do is you have your worker process, which is Java, instantiating another JVM. Um, as, as odd and unintuitive as it seems, um, it, it actually works quite well because now all of a sudden um, you're communicating uh, via standard in uh, and receiving a process signal, which you can watch from your uh, your parent process, and uh, if it dies, that's fine, because now you can say, oh, well, we have some sort of failure that we can now uh, react to. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> if you think about it, this, uh, the input is kind of an interface uh, into your auto process call, okay? So keep, keep that in mind for now, okay? Next slide. So 
Uh, one of the things that we realized by using standard in and standard out is that it's quite easy to corrupt your stream. So if you've got a particular message format, now you need to worry about how you delimit the message, how you parse it, uh, and it's very easy for a third-party library to just log, uh, you know, hello world or testing one, two, three, and now your stream is gone. So uh, what you do is you serialize to disk, and again, these are slightly unintuitive things, but what happens then is you no longer have to worry about delimiting uh, your data set. You just write it to disk, your auto process call reads it in, and uh, everything is uh, fine. Um, it is quite simple, actually. Uh, one side note, too, is that with something like GCP or any cloud provider, you can switch to SSD, so all of a sudden you don't have to worry if it's spinning disk is becoming an issue. You can actually see the graphs, and it'll tell you, you know, if your IOPS are exceeding a certain amount, you can switch to SSD, and then hopefully get up the performance that you need. So another thing to consider simultaneously is your serialization format. Um, the serialization format, obviously, you can use Java serialization, um, but then all of a sudden what happens is um, your C++ tier needs to read that back in. So we actually chose Protobuf. Um, obviously, so this is a, a choice we made. Um, it's you know, not for everybody necessarily. You could use Avril, Thrift, et cetera. But um, if you look at the next slide, so we chose it because it was quite nice to have uh, an encoder in Java and a decoder in C++, or actually you know, Python, C Sharp, et cetera. So it's important to keep that in mind because you're working with the same sort of uh, model objects, let's say, on both the uh, encoding side to, to uh, run the workflow and also uh, running the calculation, you want to be able to deserialize that object. So if you put it all together now, so you've got our worker container process writing protobuf to disk and uh, the, C the outer process call now reading it in. So uh, the even more interesting part is we thought, why use JNI at all? Why not just wrap our C++ interface with a main method? So it turns out that's even easier because now you don't have to worry about JNI. You're no longer starting up a Java JVM. Uh, and it is remarkably fast because obviously native code is, is quite fast. Um, so yeah, so if you look at this, basically it's protobuf to disk. Um, the uh, <clears throat> C++ main does a processing, outputs its result. The worker process can also watch the process signal in case it crashes, so everything seems to be nice. Um, next slide, please. So another uh, useful part about this is the fact that you can actually use this for testing. So now that you've got your output protobuf uh, from your uh, Java do fun, you can actually use this as uh, input for any C++ testing. So one thing to keep in mind in financial services, normally you have uh, quant teams writing your C++ library code, and you have IT teams doing your Java orchestration, and never the two shall meet, and there's always times when there's disagreements, and oh, who did this wrong, et cetera. So what this gives you is a quite a clear boundary, and it's quite a nice way of uh, having a serialized object that you can uh, use in either slides testing. Um, it, and like I said, it becomes the interface or the contract, actually. So this is quite important, and we'll come back to this in a second. So we also realized that the outer process call uh, isn't just useful for C++. Uh, you can call Go, you can call Python. Um, and so uh, the final output looks something like this. Our worker process gives an input uh, protobuf to disk. Our main method reads it in. We have some risk outputs, but we also have error outputs. Okay, so what we found is, um, if you go to the next slide. So this lets us actually run secondary pipelines to do uh, calculation retries. And uh, you can, in fact, um, typically in, in, in uh, again, in, in banking workflow, you have one trade causing a problem. Maybe it's due to a memory leak. If you come back to it and retry it again, oh, magically it works because now you haven't done a 1,000 trades, you're just pricing one trade. Um, so hopefully it works again through the calculation retry. And if it doesn't, you put it in a dead letter storage and you can reprocess that back later. So if you go back to my other slide, um, if the, oh, the, uh, yeah, this, uh, the unit testing. So now you can say to the quants, oh, wait, here's my output. Please run this in your unit test. And oh, look, you have a memory leak or you have a problem here. You didn't, you have an access violation. You forgot to initialize variable. So again, this is all, it works very well as an ecosystem together. And uh, it's remarkably simple to use. So back to Rush. Thank you, Fred. Uh, so just to go back to the original slide, the context is, is this, uh, which I introduced at the start. It is about recreating this ecosystem of a risk engine with Apache Beam. Um, and, and Fred has described the pitfalls of doing that because you're calling C++ processes and how we got around that. 
Um, what we did, um, and, and Sanj, who's in the audience, was, was part of our, our team, so no questions from you, Sanj. Um, the, um, the, the things we tried was on-premise using, uh, using um, Apache Beam on Flink. Uh, this is Flink in its open source form, not the DA platform version at the time. Uh, the, and with MongoDB as the source. And exactly that same code was applied in Google land with uh, Google uh, Bigtable and uh, Dataflow as the runner. So Flink as a runner on premise, Dataflow as a runner. We benchmarked uh, the populations with exactly the same number of workers between Flink uh, on premise and, and Dataflow um, in, in Google land. The, your, your, your gut instincts would be, you know, our networks are not as great as Google's dark fiber networks and we're going to be pretty crap at, at the benchmarks in, compared to, in comparison to what Google, we could achieve on GCP. But the results were, were quite surprisingly good. So let me describe what we were trying to do. So we were trying to price two million plain vanilla interest rate swaps. If, uh, I will not go into what an interest rate swap is if you don't know what it is. Uh, it, it, it's a relatively simple instrument to price. Uh, it, it requires an interest rate curve in order to price that instrument. We had 72 interest rate curves in, in 12 currencies, which was split into LIBOR and, and OIS uh, index uh, curves. We use open source Quantlib for this because we were, because the regulatory requirements of sending our own analytics to the cloud is treated as restricted data, so we stuck to open source analytics. Um, so the, the difference is the top left-hand uh, graph versus the top right-hand graph. We are comparing running Flink on-premise with XML JNI compared to Dataflow in blue. So Flink is in, in amber, Dataflow is in blue, and here the situation is you're using XML and JNI for communication between uh, the Java and the C++ piece. On the right-hand side, top right is the same graph. Amber, again, is Flink, blue is Dataflow. But in this case, we are using C uh, protobufs, and the communication is directly between the container, the Dataflow, the Flink container, uh, communicating directly using protobuf to C++. So the GNI XML piece is avoided in that case. And what was nice to see was, um, I think the two million, the, the last graph, uh, so if you look at 200,000, 400, 600, 800, two million should have been spaced a little bit further down because, but so that's why it seems nonlinear. But if you, if, you, uh, if you remove that logarithmic scaling out, you'll find that data flow and flink show relatively linear scaling characteristics right across that population um, when, you, when you scale the grid out, um, when you scale the, the population out for the same grid size. So uh, that was quite gratifying. Uh, the, the bottom graphs is essentially the sensitivity of moving from XML GNI to protobuf. The left-hand side is Flink's behavior. The right-hand side is Google Dataflow's behavior. Google Dataflow being such a incredible animal, as it were, doesn't really, you don't pay a huge penalty when, when switching from XML to protobuf. On premise, yes, when you, when, you, when you see that overhead of XML GNI and all the parsing that goes on with XML, there is a penalty to pay, and that's what's coming out in the graphs. Uh, but the main message here is that you can develop this on premise and be cloud ready without having to develop in the cloud. You know, that is the main message we'd like to, we'd like to bring across. So if, if you're trying to add value to your business and you're trying to plot your processes out from on premise to the cloud, I would always recommend that you first do this complex pieces on premise and prove that the whole thing works. And, and get the business to be as excited as we are as technologists because we just get excited by technology. The business gets excited by the, by the uh, difference in, in, in profit margins that they would see by doing this. So you know, if, if both can get excited, I think you will have a business case to go ahead with this. Um, the, 
CPUs that we deployed, we went from, uh, when we did our benchmarks on the cloud, we went from 1,000 workers to up to 20,000 workers at one point. Uh, it was quite expensive when you went to 20,000 workers, but it was, um, it was something we needed to check in terms of scale. The, 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 the graph kind of peters out beyond you know, 4,000 to 8,000, you don't see much of a gain, and beyond that it flattens out. It's got nothing to do with Dataflow or Beam. Uh, this is basically your C++ analytics, and the way that behaves, I mean, it's, there's something known as bootstrapping that goes on within interest rate curves, and um, to, to, to run a, you know, cut a very long story short, um, the importance of how you program your C++ and how the data structures in C++ are controlled and how they communicate with the Beam process is as important if you want to see that scale out happen. I mean, if you can imagine you're doing one million trades and you know, 5,000 scenario Monte Carlos, you may want the scale out to continue as you move to 20,000 workers, maybe even 100,000 workers. And, and this is where your interaction with the quant team and the people who do that C++ code is very, very important. Because if you just work in isolation, you will see uh, not much benefits by, by the scale out that you could have otherwise have achieved. Um, just to conclude, um, in order for us to be able to move from Flink on premise to, uh, to Google Dataflow, we had to make sure that our IO was separate from the workflow in the pipeline, that we could plug in MongoDB and take exactly the same Beam pipeline and take it to cloud and switch to Bigtable with no code change, the same jar file goes across. Uh, we have, uh, I've given you some references, these, these PDFs will be distributed to you guys so you will have uh, full access to them. But, but there is a blog that explains how we achieved this using pipeline options. Uh, this was done both in, so we've done this entire exercise in Java. We have repeated it in Python in its entirety. Uh, there, are, there is also a blog on, on the difference between Java and Python as it is today. That will change. One of the striking things is you can't shuffle uh, protobufs inside Python. You do get pickling errors you will be restricted to shuffling JSON objects within Python and converting to protobufs only at the point you need the protobuf. So um, it's not a Beam problem, it's a Python problem. Um, so the, the whole point of the process was about your journey to the cloud, about de-risking your processes, replicating whatever you can on premise. Uh, so you know, we, we seriously recommend looking at the, the DA platform, uh, Flink, which has come out in, in its Docker form. You can run, if you, are, if you have the privilege of running Kubernetes cluster inside your premise with the DA platform, you get near data flow behavior with it. Um, and that way you can make sure that everything works, everything is, um, you know, even your DevOps processes can be tuned to make sure you're ready for the cloud before you actually move to the cloud. Because I think when you're moving technologies, you're moving paradigms, you're moving operational processes, there's a lot of risk involved and business tend to be risk averse. So if you want to take them with you on the journey, you know this is a nice way of, of taking them on that journey where you de-risk part of the process, confirm that it works, and then take on the additional risk uh, that changing operational process brings. Some references um, that you can go and have a look at. This, like I said, the slides will be distributed to you guys. Thank you.